we are going into the next session where there are going to be two book launches. The first is called Love Letter to Kashmir and the second is Boatman Take These Songs From Me. They invite Gabriel Rawson Stock and Masood Hussain to please take the ties. Let me give a brief introduction and I'm sure my introduction will be incomplete. So I will ask both of you to add on to it uh, if there's something beyond that. Uh, Gabriel Rawson Stock is an Irish writer who works chiefly in the Irish language. He's a poet, playwright, haikuist, tankaist, essayist, and author translator of over 180 books. Uh, he is okay, and uh, Masood Hussain is a Kashmiri visual artist and draftsman. He's a prolific watercolorist and has fathomed the essence of Kashmiri life. So I will request you to start with the uh, release of the book. Or... Well done. Is there a way? Yeah. Here's a girl, Sana. Okay. She is also perfectly introduced. Oh, okay. Here. Yeah. Do you have her number or something? Following one. Nita. Pick up. That was, yeah. What the book? That was,
Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Gulf for having us, for having us back. We were here before. Um, it's not every day that somebody launches not, not one book, but two. Two very contrasting books. Love Letter to Kashmir and Boatman Take These Songs from Me. Uh, Love Letter to Kashmir was published by a small poetry publisher in New York, Cross Cultural Communications, and Boatman was published here in India by Manipal Universal Press. This type of poetry, which is some haiku and a lot of tanka, uh, needs perhaps a little explanation. Why write Tanka and why write it in Irish or bilingually in Irish and English? As it happens, Tanka is the oldest form of poetry still being cultivated today. It dates back 1300 years to the courts of the emperors and retired emperors of Japan. During my, if you like, 40 year apprenticeship to the haiku form, anybody who is interested in haiku we know of the Grand Master Matsu Basho, 17th century Grand Master of the form. And he said, don't follow me. Follow the masters of old, those masters who had mastery in so many different Japanese arts, such as the tea ceremony, such as no drama, N-O-H, no drama, <laughs> and <laughs> Tanka. And for Basho, the supreme uh, master of the Tanka form was a medieval monk, sometimes called a reluctant ascetic, called Saigo. So I apprenticed myself to Saigo. He wasn't around physically. But I apprenticed myself in this manner, collecting as many versions of his tanka as I could find and transcreating them into Irish. I don't use the word translate if I don't know the, the original language, if I'm using a crib um, or an English version as a bridge. So I transcreated a uh, side go. And in doing that, managed to master this form, tanka form, to the extent that I now create tanka spontaneously to give you a further illustration of what this work is about. These tanka are, strictly speaking, ekphrastic tanka, and that's from a Greek word ekphrasis, Ekphrastic tanka or ekphrastic poetry or fiction or any type of ekphrastic writing is writing that responds to works of art. The works of art come first. And then the spontaneous haiku or the spontaneous ekphrastic tanka in response to the artwork. Now, 
I like to believe that there are different energies working here. There's the universal creative intelligence that informs uh, Masood Hussain's watercolors in Love Letter to Kashmir. I would hope there's also an element of uh, universal creative intelligence found in the texts that I've provided for these two books. This could lead to a third intelligence, which is the fusion of these two art forms, creating another dynamic, and so on and so forth, because I could also say that there's the element, there's the energy or the dynamic of the discipline of the Japanese arts that have been cultivated for over a thousand years. Their particular style, sensibility, feeling, all these go into these creations as well. And the tanka, over the centuries, demands a kind of an elevated, an elevated style. Uh, you know, it's not rap. It's an elevated style, um, which emphasizes gracefulness and longing. And it, it can be infused with uh, mystic qualities as well, as was the case with Saigo. What is poetry after all? It's elevated speech. <laughs> poetry began as chant. I think most literary historians and anthropologists agree that the origins of poetry were in chant. The chanting, of course, helped generations before the age of literacy to remember and memorize long passages, you know, going back to the Homeric um, epics, all learned off by heart. Uh, in India, uh, in the Vedic tradition, Young boys would be learning all this stuff off, off by heart. Sometimes with the um, additional help of Ayurvedic herbs, such as Brahmi, a herb I take myself, great for the brain, great for memory. So, as the introduction stated, I'm an Irish language poet, essentially, and I... Yep. Um, not all of my colleagues uh, agree with me, but I feel that a language such as Irish, which is on the death list, one of the endangered languages of the world, please don't forget that languages are dying at a rate of one per fortnight all over the world, especially tribal languages in South and North America, at a rapid, at a rapid and alarming rate. Sometimes we see the great decline of species in the world of flo flora and fauna uh, as being related in some strange way to the, the, the decline of uh, languages, languages which for centuries uh, enshrined the wisdom and the insights and the skills needed to protect species and to protect the environment. As these languages decline and make way for the bulldozers, uh, well, the world ends up in the mess we find it in now. Um, I read a few more uh, of the texts in Irish or English, I'll allow you to read them in silence if you wish, and then we'll both take uh, any questions and answers. We'll have a question and answer session. I hope you have some questions ready. Not that I, 
I have all the answers ready because, you know, sometimes when you allow yourself this type of ekphrastic, spontaneous uh, happening, sometimes you actually don't know fully yourself with the conscious mind what, what exactly you're saying. Because there are elements of, of, of these poems that are in fact mystic. And the mystic poet is, I think, a, a rare species today. Um, but uh, I don't think there would ever come uh, a time when we will, we will be without mystic poets. And in fact, planning ahead, uh, Masood and I are hoping to do a new edition of the poetic utterances of uh, Kabir, the great weaver of Varanasi. Updating Tagore's version, I'll also be adding my Irish versions to it. Um, and that's something to look forward to and other projects. But I'll read a few more so you get a better flavor uh, of this art form. And if you have questions for Masood or myself, We'll try to answer them. Hmm. Yes. So, uh, I want to tell something about myself. I, how I am involved with Gabriel. Well, uh, I don't know. It's, it's a coincidence. Have we met? So it's strange thing. Uh, Gabriel was uh, writing haikus on uh, Gandhi. And I was introduced by a friend of mine who lives in the uh, United States. And uh, so, to, and we coordinated. And then he kept on sending me the haikus and I created illustrations and I never knew that uh, who Gabriel was but I was interested in working uh, on Gandhi and I have painted quite a number of uh, uh, paintings on Gandhi and this was something different I had never heard of haikus and uh, this thing, so it's something I have been painting conflict throughout my life. And Gabriel's poetry gave me a new direction to work, you know. And I learned a lot from him. And uh, the last illustration I did, and then there was a lockdown, uh, in Kashmir and the inter internet was taken off for many months. Then I never knew that uh, what happened to the book, you know. Then somebody, a friend of mine came, came from Delhi and he bought a newspaper and he showed it to me that your name is there and the book uh, uh, has been published in, I think, most probably in Dublin. And uh, the name of that book uh, is uh, Walk with Gandhi. And one can easily download it uh, uh, from internet. And it's full of illustrations. And you will enjoy uh, reading that book. And then after that, it, it never stopped. You know, I uh, made almost, uh, we made together about 40 uh, um, uh, videos 
on art and poetry and which is available on YouTube. And you can uh, really enjoy those uh, uh, short videos. And uh, uh, you can go, uh, you can go, uh, 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 you can see it on YouTube uh, uh, on Inner Soul Films. And then uh, we uh, did these two books. And we happened to meet um, on 10th edition of uh, uh, this literary festival. So I met him for the first time. And then we never stopped and uh, we did these two books and then uh, hopefully we are going for another book on Kabir. Uh, so that is uh, again my paintings and uh, his writings. So let us hope to continue to work with him and share our thoughts with you. Thank you so much. Yes, Some questions we find, yeah. Microphone coming to you. Well, we have plenty up there. Uh... There is a, uh, thank you very much. Enjoyed uh, watching those two films. And uh, there is a Sufi flavor to all the po to the poetry that I read. Um, I mean, uh, the only mystic poetry I know is Sufi and Kabir. And uh, it's interesting that... Um, you have this uh, Irish background and uh, you write in the same sort of language. And I was wondering where that came for, from for you. I mean, where, where, the, where the words came from to you? Mm -hmm. Well, my interest in Sufism, for instance, well, it's a very strange, it's a very strange thing. People, people often talk about, you know, crisis in poetry reading. Nobody's reading poetry. And yet, the number one bestseller in the U.S. is the verses by Coleman Box of uh, Rumi. Mm -hmm. So, um, I tell you, there's a, um, there's a very beautiful poetry site uh, on the internet called Poetry Chaikana. Chaikana is in a kind of a tea hut in the Himalayas. And this is devoted to sacred poetry in all traditions, including, you know, what, what, Sufism, obviously, but Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Tibetan Buddhism, the whole, the whole gamut. It's, it's um, wonder, wonderfully organized and... Um, the same pub the same publisher um, brought out a few books of mine. One of them was called Haiku Enlightenment, in which I argue in many different ways about haiku not just being a literary form, but as a way of life, as a way of as a way of awakening to special moments that are happening all the time in the natural world around us. But I think it took the peculiar genius of the Japanese Zen poets to draw our attention to them. A little, a little fly going in and out the window. Who is going to notice that? Nobody, because our minds are full of, well, the daily junk. To even notice that little fly but uh, the Zen poets of Japan made it their business to notice these things. So when I first went to university in Cork, which is a city in the south of Ireland, I shared a flat with this guy called Roderick Campbell. And Roderick had a history of haiku by a famous Londoner who was living in Japan called Reginald Horace Blythe. And that gave me a great insight into, into haiku. And there and then, I knew I wanted to bring this gift of haiku to the Irish language and to Irish poetics. Because, you see, we had something a little bit 
like haiku in our own native tradition. Uh, you know, th th this emphasis on, on three, three, which is the, the haiku, but it's one vertical line in Japanese, but it's in all non-Japanese lang languages, it's represented in three lines. So we had hundreds of these kind of proverbial sayings in Irish with the emphasized three. And they looked a bit like haiku on the page. So I'll give you an example of one of them. This says, this is introduced by saying, what are the three sweetest sounds? The three sweetest sounds. Game, bo, melt, pro, bake, linnith. The lowing of a cow, the grinding of a millstone, the crying of a child. The three sweetest sounds. So in a way, we had this compression in early Irish poetry, which, by the way, is the oldest uh, literature in Europe after Latin and Greek. People forget about that. I mean, when they think of Irish literature, they think of Yeats or Joyce or Beckett or Eni, people like that. Irish literature is a thousand years older than that in the senior language of Ireland, the language that I have embraced, a beautiful language, unfortunately dying at a very rapid rate. Um, it's, I would say that the, 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 the list, the, the amount of native speakers of Irish in the past 150 years has declined from something like 2 million to 50,000. It's just horrific. Um, so, uh, I, um, I attended university in the late 60s, early 70s, and that was a time in the United States when a lot of the so-called beat generation of poets, one of them, Allen Ginsberg, came to, came to India and met with the hungry generation of poets of Bengal and people people of that nature, but um, he became very interested in, in very, uh, various aspects of Indian religious experience, including Buddhism, and he and Jack Kerouac and others were involved in uh, the Naropa School of Disembodied Poetics uh, with the guru um, Rinpoche, the very reverend Chagyam Rinpoche. So all this was happening. The environment movement was beginning to grow as well in the end of the 60s with beat poets like Gary Snyder mm -hmm. who had, were interested in deep ecology. Um, but, you know, in, in, in a way, I met, I, met, I met Ginsburg in Dublin many years, many years ago. And, you know, in a way, he was a very, very serious figure. But in some respects, he was also a bit of a comic figure in the sense that he and his colleagues tried to levitate the Pentagon. They went up, they stood outside the Pentagon and they used various chants and they tried to levitate the damn thing. So, you know, they were, they were crazy guys, but uh, Ginsburg in particular was very interested in, in haiku, in Eastern spirituality. Jack Kerouac, whom I have translated, was, was a master haikuist. Uh, he was also very interested in, in Buddhism and in haiku. So, all, all, all this wave, hippie kind of a wave, <laughs> with many genuine, serious aspects to it, came to Ireland at a time when my literary career was about to start. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, we'll get you a mic. <laughs> Tell us about your interest in Gandhi. How did it begin and where has it taken you? Well, um, <laughs> Somebody reminded me, or I reminded myself, that the 150th anniversary of his birth 
was coming up. So I decided I would have to do something about that. Uh, so I wrote a kind of a, a potted biography that would have been suitable for young adults and perhaps adults as well. And a mutual friend of ours, an, uh, a Kashmiri American poet, Rafiq Kaswari, had a look at this and he said, ah, but you're using, you know, um, as many photographs as you can get that are in public domain. Why not get an artist to do these instead? So it was Rafiq who introduced me to uh, Masood. And just at that time, I was, I was reacquainting myself with um, some of the people on the left in Ireland, people uh, associated with the trade union movement and peace movements as well. And when they heard what I was up to, they decided to support me. So we managed to have a huge concert in Liberty Hall in, in, in the center of Dublin, the home of the Irish trade, trade union movement. And um, that's how, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to encapsulate in haiku various moments, such as the, the Salt March and so on, various periods of imprisonment, Gandhi visiting Downing Street and so on. So, um, that was my interest. And I knew also that um, Gandhi had been somewhat influenced by classical anarchism when he was in uh, London. And I had, re I had begun to embrace uh, forms of anarchism in my own thoughts, uh, in the sense that, um, like, who, looking at the world today, could really b believe in his heart and soul that the state is doing good, you know, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Israel, in in, in, in Palestine, I mean, in, in Kashmir, you know, the, the, the state is very often a mischievous, a mischievous devil. Tony Blair announced uh, the, the invasion of Iraq, not the people of, of England, not the people of Britain, not the, the workers, not the baker, not the, not the postman, not the barman. It was politicians and government for their own geopolitical reasons and for oil. Now, you ask me, how has Gandhi affected my life? When I'm, I'm since I became absorbed in his thinking and in his actions and in his tactics, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more convinced that pacif pacifism and civil disobedience are the only routes. Uh, it was Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mandela, people of the people of that ilk, people of that. Um, vision who inspired the civil rights marches in Northern Ireland, as you, you as I'm sure you know. Um, Gandhi, Martin Luther King and Mandela are still torches, inspirational torches, torches for, you know, conflict resolution anywhere in the world. Um, Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. Okay. How are we for time? Ten minutes. Hmm? Ten minutes. Talk about two questions. Then yeah, ask question. Please do. Is there a Gandhian solution to Kashmir? <laughs> I think to uh, tell you frankly, you know, uh, 
uh, as a Kashmiri, you know, just to be frank enough, last time when I visited uh, the tenth edition, you know, somebody came to me in the morning and he told me that uh, so we have kept a special session morning in Kashmir. Then ultimately, when uh, we gathered uh, on the dais, and then it was titled as Morning in Kashmir. And now, uh, see, since uh, application of uh, Article 370, uh, people are confused, you know. They are not really sure about their fate. And, uh, well, they, uh, the present regime talks about uh, development, smart city, and nobody is interested in smart city and beautiful roads and uh, lovely, uh, these digital fountains. It doesn't fit in our environment. And, uh, well, no doubt, okay, development of roads is going on. So there is a lot of tourism coming up. And, uh, but every time we get new notices, they keep on changing the laws. And our younger generation has taken up drugs. And you cannot imagine, I think, uh, it's in lax. Right from age, say, seven to all the teenagers, a lot of unemployment. And people don't know that what's our fate, you know. They have lost their identity. And now I don't know where Gandhi fits into that, you know. So, we're simply watching the situation, so what's going to be next? So let's hope things will be better. So I remember, you know, I have been painting conflict for the past 40 years. And uh, I have covered almost everything what I have faced, right from crackdowns, right from uh, so many things, you know. So, and whenever I used to accept my paintings and my last painting used to be hope. And that's what we are looking for. So, we have a hope. Maybe someday we will settle down and have a better life. And I hope, uh, so that's what I think as an artist. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Speaking as, a, as an outsider and not knowing the intricacies of Kashmir or any other areas of India really, though myself and my wife have been to India 20 times, it seems to me that if if Gandhi has something real to offer all of mankind, that he must be reinvented, because the youth of today um, see him as he was, and the f the the figure he was, the way he spoke, the way he wrote, his actions, and he. he he is probably frozen in time for them, and they may find it difficult to embrace 
such a figure, the way he was embraced in his lifetime and idolized by millions who saw that he stood for suffering and the end of oppression. So any figure in history, Gandhi, Jesus, they need to be reinvented for our own times, clothes in our own times, you know. I think we need a Gandhi in jeans. Or else he's not going to speak to a younger generation. Um, and actually, Masood has done quite a lot in that in that respect. Um, one of the posters we did together, Gandhi-inspired posters, has Gandhi with a, a red umbrella and it's lashing rain and there are refugees on the road and those refugees were not just representing the time of partition of India but refugees anywhere in the world today and they are as we know, they're on the sea from France to Britain, they're everywhere, and they would increase, and displacement would increase unquestionably uh, with, with, um, with climate change and wars. So a little haiku I wrote to this image that Masood created was, Ligestachiot, Fil mano slani trecht de kishtachnar gri yet. Let them in. Weary men, women, and children, let them in to our hearts. Now, the whole thing is, is an effective poster, but it's very much relevant to what is happening today and what's going to continue to happen for years to come. So he, 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 we can make him relevant, we can make him central to, um, to, to our disposition, to, to how we stand in relation to um, troubled spots in the world. And I'm critical of my own government quite a lot, but only the other day we heard that they gave 20 million to UNRWA for relief in, in Palestine, and that was very welcome news. So with that, I think we'll conclude. Say something. Yeah, please do. Just wanted to say a line about Gandhi and the, I mean, what Ms. Dyer raised. That to Gandhi, the idea of making of Cre, he was so fierce about this vision for India being a place where every ethnic group, every minority group felt so comfortable and so safe. And of course, as we know, he was ready to fast unto death also for that. So, I mean, that whole, how much that inclusion meant to Gandhi was something I think to be remembered. To say that. So much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think the both the paintings and the poetry that went with it leave us with hope, and that's what we need today. Thank you. <laughs>